Instagram.com. Coronavirus spike protein activated natural immune response, damaged heart muscle cells. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. That's the title of an article about brand new research that was presented at the American Heart Association, but has not yet been published. We're going to talk about this research, which basically shows, number one, that the spike protein on heart muscle cells is directly toxic and that it doesn't need the ACE2 receptor to cause the damage in question. As you know, there's been a lot of talk about the cardiovascular complications of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Even in some of the vaccines, there's been some reports and studies showing inflammation of the heart tissue known as myocarditis. So as always, we are going to go ahead and put the links in the description below of all of these articles and studies that we're going to talk about. But let's get down to what these researchers actually did. So this study was performed at the Masonic Medical Research Institute in Utica, New York, and the lead author of the study and the assistant professor there was Dr. Ju Chung Lin. So what they did was they looked at a mouse model, and they wanted to infect mice in two different ways to show the difference between the spike protein and other coronavirus spike proteins, specifically the SARS-CoV-2 and another human coronavirus. Now, the first thing you need to understand is that mice cells have an ACE2 receptor, but it is completely different than the ACE2 receptor that we see in human beings. In fact, the ACE2 receptor in mice do not interact in any way with the spike protein on SARS-CoV-2. The next thing that they did was they took a viral vector. Now, let me explain a little bit of what a viral vector is. A viral vector is basically a way of delivering genetic information to the cell that you want to deliver it to, and that viral vector is able to infect that cell and to transmit that genetic material to the nucleus of the cell. In this case, they used the adeno-associated virus type 9. That's AAV9. And if you want to know more about adeno-associated virus vectors, I point you to this research article that just came out in March of this year that's actually showing that it may actually be a way of getting the COVID-19 virus into cells to develop antibodies. And so if you want to understand more about how these virus vectors are used, which could give you some more information in terms of what we're about to talk about, I think this would be a great article, and we'll put that in the link below. So what we're doing here is we're setting up two different conditions. As you can see, we have a viral vector here on the left and a viral vector here on the right, and we're going to infect the same type of cells. The first thing that they did was they cloned the SARS-CoV-2 virus spike protein. Now, in the transcript presented at the American Heart Association, they did not specify which variant it was that they cloned. In other words, it could have been Omicron, it could have been Delta, it could have been Alpha, Beta, P1, it could have been the original. We don't know which spike protein they were referring to. Hopefully that will come out in the manuscript. And once they got that spike protein sequence, they then put it into the viral vector as a portion of the DNA. And they did the same thing with a human coronavirus. This is a virus that would give you a cold It could give you some respiratory issues, but it would never cause any problems with your heart. HCoV NL63. So they sequenced that spike protein, and they included that DNA in the viral vector. So, of course, these viral vectors have spike proteins on their surface. And a key point to understand here is that the spike proteins from both respective viruses actually interact with the ACE2 receptor on humans, but they don't interact with the ACE2 receptor in mice. So that's important to understand. Let me say that again. Both spike proteins are able to interact with the ACE2 receptor on human beings, but neither of these interact with the ACE2 receptor on the surface of heart cells in mice. So what happens is the viral vectors infect the cell of the mice and the DNA goes into the nucleus where it becomes double-stranded and then it starts to transcribe into messenger RNA. The messenger RNA then makes the spike proteins and the spike proteins, of course, are put on the surface of the cells. 
And of course, just to be clear, I'm drawing a line here because these are two different events that are occurring, but I'm showing it as one here, and I'm just dividing this to show you that this is happening here on the left in one situation, and this is happening here on the right in a different situation. And so those cells that are infected with AAV9 with the SARS-CoV-2 spike, of course, they make the spike proteins on the surface. They also have some, of course, in the cytoplasm, and some of them actually get secreted out into the extracellular space. And that happens not only for SARS-CoV-2 spike, but also for the human COVID-NL63 as well. And of course, I want to reinforce here that the ACE2 enzyme in this particular mouse cell is not being deactivated. Nothing is happening to the ACE2 receptor here. The ACE2 receptor continues to function normally because, again, none of these spike proteins that you see anywhere on this page are interacting with the mouse ACE2 receptor. What happens next? What they found is that there were a number of proteins and inflammation that was occurring here with the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, but not with the HCoV-NL63 spike experiment on the right side. What they found was a number of proteins along with the spike protein over here on the left, specifically called the toll-like receptor 4. So what is the toll-like receptor for? It's a protein that is attached to natural killer cells that tells the natural killer cells that this is something that should not be there. It's part of the innate immune system. It does not require previous infection. This is something that innately the immune system knows should not be there and goes after it. In addition to all of these toll-like receptor 4s, there was a lot of inflammation and also enlargement of these cells. So the cells grew in size, became dysfunctional, and also became inflamed. And if you want to read more about toll-like receptors in natural killer cells and their application for immunotherapy, and some basic information about this, you can read here in this article, which we'll put a link to in the description below. But just to satisfy some of your curiosity here, you can see that cells involved in the innate immune system response were initially speculated to be non-specific eliminate microbes without presensitization. However, studies have reported that the innate immune cells recognize microbial associated or pathogen associated molecular patterns. And that is exactly what is happening here on this side but not happening in this experiment where there is a regular HCoV-NL63 spike protein, which means to say that there's something about the spike protein after it is created in the natural environment of the cardiac cell in mice here that causes a reaction that has nothing to do with shutting down the ACE2 receptor. Let me say that again. There is something about the spike protein, specifically with SARS-CoV-2, that is not the same as the spike protein, which, by the way, hits the same receptor in human beings, the ACE2 receptor. Something different that does not cause inflammation here, but does over here. So there must be a protein or a pathogen-associated molecular pattern, or PAMP, that is triggering the response here on this side, but is not triggering the response here on this side. And again, because the ACE2 receptor in mice are different than those in humans, and because neither of these spike proteins affects the ACE2 receptor in mice, we cannot say that this is an ACE2-mediated inflammatory reaction. What the authors of this study don't know is whether or not it is spike protein that is bound to the surface of the cell, or whether it is soluble proteins that are causing this reaction to occur, and that is going to be the source of more information shortly. The question is, is this the mechanism that's going on right now with myocarditis and inflammatory conditions of the heart in patients who get SARS-CoV-2? And could it also be some of the reasons why people who get vaccines get also inflammation of the heart? It's worth pointing out at this point that not everybody with SARS-CoV-2 gets inflammation of the heart muscle, and certainly not everybody who gets SARS-CoV-2 vaccine gets heart muscle inflammation. So the question is, is what is it that causes some people to get it and others not? Of course, there are differences in genetics. There's differences in environment. There may be differences in the amount of spike protein. There's also some question about the type of spike protein. We said here that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein was sequenced and is the reason why we have this spike protein on this viral vector. We don't know which variant of SARS-CoV-2 it was. 
What about vaccine-derived spike protein? Well, as it turns out, the spike protein that is sequenced and put into the vaccines, specifically the Moderna, the Pfizer, the Johnson & Johnson, and the Novavax, are actually significantly different in a specific way from the spike protein in the SARS-CoV-2. Now, would that be enough to make a difference or not? Well, we don't know. That study has not been performed. For those of you who are regular MedCram listeners will know that the spike protein was specifically engineered in the vaccines to stay in the pre-fusion complex. That was work that was done by Jason McClellan out of the University of Texas in Austin. And his work was specifically used in the development of both mRNA vaccines, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and also the Novavax vaccine. And specifically, the purpose of that was to keep the spike protein fused in a specific conformation so that it would be more immunogenic in that conformation. The spike protein that we see on SARS-CoV-2 is not fused in that position, but rather is very wobbly and can go into many different types of positions. And if you're interested in learning more about that particular topic and actually hear a presentation by Jason McClellan and how he came about to discover this and what the techniques were, we'll put a link to the video where he describes exactly what he's doing. The other interesting thing about this is the fact that if you are going to get inflammation in the heart, it is the heart muscle cells themselves that need to make the spike protein. And for that to occur, you actually have to have viral particles getting to the heart. And that involves, of course, a viremia that involves getting viral particles at high enough concentrations that they actually spill over into the blood. And of course, this is something that happens in people who get SARS-CoV-2 in a very serious way where the virus is replicating in multiple places in the body and exponentially growing. There's been a question, of course, as to whether or not this is the same thing that is happening in those who are getting the vaccine. So vaccines that are entering into muscle cells in the arm, for instance, are they getting into the blood supply? And there's been a debate and a question about whether or not aspiration of the syringe is helpful in this situation to prevent the vaccine nanoparticles, specifically in the mRNA vaccines, from getting in to the blood supply. But what's interesting is that the particular types of patients who are getting my myocarditis in the mRNA vaccines are those specifically young gentlemen who are getting it after their second dose. And, and that would portend for us to believe that if people were going to get the injection into the blood, it should not be in people specifically who are younger, but it should be distributed evenly. So that sort of goes against that theory. The other aspect of this that is interesting is that notice that in this study, it's the innate immune system which is causing the inflammation. As we've said, the innate immune system does not require previous exposure. It understands that these pathogen-associated protein molecules are something that they know. It's innate to them. It would seem to me that you would see the reaction equally after the first or the second injection. Whereas the second injection, you're getting more of a adaptive immune response where you have antibodies that are now forming and that would be more likely to cause the inflammation. So it's unclear as to whether or not this study answers all of those questions. I think it does bring up some very interesting points, but there's some definite work that still needs to be done as to say whether or not this particularly is the mechanism for why we are seeing myocarditis in some people who are getting vaccinations early on, especially those who are younger and those who are male. And of course, as we've said before, there has been no studies done on the spike protein that are derived from vaccines in this type of a setting. And I believe that that type of a study should be done because as we've already mentioned, the vaccine spike is deliberately different than the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And this study was looking specifically at the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And that's interesting, again, because when we look at the cells of the immune system, notice that the innate immune system is the immune system that gets weaker with age. So the innate immune system is going to be very powerful when you're young. And as we've talked about before, it makes things like, for instance, the natural killer cell, the monocytes, all of these things are involved with producing interferon, which is the body's way of protecting against viral infections very early on in the infection timeline. It's interesting to me because it's typically people who have had very serious infections are the ones more likely that are getting the cardiac complications of the virus. 
So it almost seems as though the innate immune system is being held off not being allowed to work early on. But then as the immune system is suppressed, the virus then spreads, and it's only then later that the innate immune system is allowed to do what it needs to do. And this is not new. For those who have watched Meg Cram, they will know that we've talked about this before. You can see here in a letter that was written by Nancy Goh, she writes here, studies of SARS and MERS suggest that the interferon response is delayed compared with coronaviruses that cause mild disease and with milder cases of these two coronaviruses that can cause severe disease, the patients with severe SARS or MERS had higher viral loads and delayed interferon responses. So let's just pause right there. In comparison to our NL63 coronavirus, which just affects the lungs, this is one of those mild cases, they don't seem to delay the interferon response. This is what is being said here in a paper that was published at the beginning of the pandemic. However, there's something about SARS-CoV-2 that delays the innate immune response. Could it be that the reason why we're seeing a difference between SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and the NL63 spike protein is that there's something about the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein that is delaying the innate immune response? Let's go on. Thus, it could be that patients most susceptible to severe disease are those that cannot mount an effective early antiviral immune response. A study of 50 patients with cases ranging from mild to severe found that gene expression profiles indicating type 1 and type 2 interferon responses were highest in patients with mild to moderate disease and were low in the patients with severe or critical disease. A similar difference in type 1 interferon activity was detected in the serum from the patients. Patients with more severe disease had less type 1 interferon activity in their blood. Now remember, type 1 interferon activity is the result of the innate immune system. So again, let's pull back. Let's think about this. Could it be that the reason why we're seeing more damage in the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is that the innate immune system has been turned off early and is now coming on late while the virus has had a chance to get to the heart? Is that possible? Well, let's see here. Innate immune system and type 1 interferon activity, as you can see here very clearly, those that had very good innate immune system responses had mild disease as opposed to those who had low innate immune system responses, which had critical disease. Is it possible that this innate immune system is being suppressed and delayed early on, and then that causes severe disease, and only after that point that you start to see a ramping up of the innate immune system and the inflammation of the cardiac muscle? We've seen that in a number of studies. Here's another study that was published in Science that shows that those people who had mutations in their innate immune system, their ability to produce interferon, the thing that they found that caused inflammation with the toll-like receptors and the natural killer cells, well, let's just knock all of that out. Well, what happens? There's no innate immune system response. And these are the people, without exception, that had severe COVID-19. Those that had antibodies against the interferon response. Again, there was no interferon response. These also had very severe COVID-19 outcomes. So the bottom line is there's a lot of data. There's a lot of research. This has not yet been published. So we don't have the details about exactly what type, for instance, variant they used in the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in the viral vector. We don't know whether it's the soluble spike protein that's causing this or whether it's spike protein that's specifically attached to the cellular membrane. And again, we don't know why the vast majority of people who get SARS-CoV-2 never get heart inflammation. And for that matter, the vast majority of people who get vaccination don't get inflammation of the heart muscle. This probably doesn't explain everything, but it does raise more questions. And that's exactly what we want in science is questions so that we can do more research and find out more answers. I want to thank you for joining us. Subscribe, turn on notifications, and join us at medcram.com. For continuing medical education on topics such as ECG interpretation, basic metabolic panel CHEM7 results, and CBC results explained clearly. Thanks for joining us.